the grace of God. Amen. I want to be, begin with the concept of holiness. Amen. See, the gospel of grace in the scripture is something that is so precious to believers now because I personally love the message of grace, you know, which we can find in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. You know, Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus. He says, we cannot be saved without it, for we are saved by grace through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. So grace defined is unmerited favor. It's God's free gift to us. It is unmerited because it is never based on our performance, but wholly based on God's goodness. See, Christians are usually strong in understanding that salvation is not based on our works. However, some modern day teachers on grace have taken a twist on this concept of grace and turned it into, into something false. You know, what is worse is that most people, Christians, swallow it all hook, line, and sinker because it sounds good, you know? So let's think about it. In the first epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 9, he writes, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Now ponder that for a moment. If you are born of God, meaning if you are saved, if you're born again, you cannot commit sin. And a lot of people take that and they interpret it and internalize it. But what is this um, specific verse of scripture really talking about? It is talking about, bear with me here. It is talking about sinning habitually. See, 1 John 3, 9, who is, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. It does not teach that Christians cannot commit sin. The Greek of a word in this verse shows that the person who is a Christian will not remain in the habit of sin as a lifestyle. And that's something different. In other words, it could be translated, whoever is born of God does not commit sin continually as a lifestyle. Because as long as we remain in the body, we are not perfected. It, is, it has absolutely no reference at all to the Christian not being able to sin. You know, now let's even consider an antecedent. Adam, Adam was born directly of God, yet he sinned spiritually. So this cannot mean that someone born of God cannot commit sin. It means that no one born of God practices sin as a lifestyle on purpose. It is, every, it is pretty evident that Christians can commit sin for John wrote in 1 John 2, 1, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And if you go down to 1 John 5, 17, he confirms this also. So it is an error to think that the grace of God has given us now the privilege that we no longer commit sin or that our sin it is, uh, is of no consequence. Amen? Let us dig further as we look at these concentric circles of grace. Thank God that grace is not based on our soundness, but instead based entirely on the righteousness of God. Amen. Now there is another phenomenon that's happening in Second Timothy chapter four, verse three. There's a prophecy, you know. It says, "For the time will come when they, they who believers, will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own grace." See, so there seems to be very little discernment these days. Most Christians today hunger for a preacher that preaches something positive, you know, and that's about all they can handle. Anything other than that, mentioning repentance or addressing bad behavior, it's time to find another church. You know, this guy is too serious. He's fire and brimstone. He's judgmental. It seems that we find ourselves in the middle of these times prophesied in 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tinkled will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desire. 
So this grace message comes at a time when positivity is at an all time high. But we are to be reminded that the God that we serve does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So all of a sudden, uh, holiness cannot be waved off at the altar of grace. We must still be held to account of holiness. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, I want to talk about leavening. You know, for those of us who bake or those who are cooks, leavening, leaven is a, is a yeast, you know, that you use to uh, make a, a, a baking rise, you know. You know, for Jude uh, chapter 1, in the God, uh, book of Jude chapter 1 verse 4, it says, certain persons have crept in to the church unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into a licentiousness, uh, into licentiousness and deny our only master and our Lord Jesus. So there is a tactic, there is a conspiracy theory, there is an enemy afoot within the brethren, within the fold, who are taking the grace, the gospel of grace, the covenant of grace, the dispensation of grace. They are now taking that as a license to sin. And just like the leaven, which goes into uh, baking and makes the whole thing rise, there is a leavening in the church of God. You see, I want to talk about, uh, not talk about the meat, but the poison that can be add, that has been added to the meat. If someone offered you a big juicy steak and said, I've only added just a drop of poison to it. Now, would you eat it? No, of course not. Because of the leavening. You know, the little drop of poison is going to spread out. It's no should you swallow and follow all kinds of grace teachings. The consequences of some of these poisonous grace teachings are truly deadly. Just like Jude warned us, you know, that there is an enemy afoot who is sowing in this freedom that the grace offers. They're looking for ways to drag people into their own death traps. You know, so we have to be mindful that even within the church, this is happening. People have crept in on notice and they're spewing this lie from the pits of hell. You know, let us continue to examine the concentric sessions of grace. Now, let's look at it inherently. You see, the, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, say, what shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may increase? You know, and Paul responds, you know, maybe it may it never be. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? You see, there's a horrendous heresy today that the church has been fighting since the days of Paul. It teaches that the body is evil and that the spirit of man is good. They have this dichotomy that the spirit is good, but the body is bad. So you can do anything in the body and it doesn't matter. You are right, as long as you're right with God in your spirit. This is a devilish doctrine. Christians' sins do have consequences. If a Christian does not repent, which is the subject you never hear false grace teachers mention is repentance, the Christian could be lost. There is no eternal security in apostasy. If you turn away from the goodness of God, if you turn away from God's uh, sealing, you could definitely be lost. Now, Jesus teaches us that sins are not external to us, but that they come from within us. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verse 15, it says, there's nothing outside of man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of man are what defiled him. Remember when the Pharisees came to him and they said he didn't perform the ceremonial hand-washing rituals and all of that. That's when he told them, all sins start from within the man. The man may be tempted by external forces like demons and lust of the flesh and body, but man chooses from within to act on it. Therefore, sins are part of man's spirit and soul. Hallelujah. So there is no rift. There is no fissure between the body and the spirit of man. You make a, you constitute a single being. Your spirit and your body are in alignment 
with God. If they are not, you cannot sin with your body and then be holy with your spirit, which is what this false message, you know, uh, spin off of the gospel of grace teaches. May God help us. Hallelujah. Let us look further from the inherent, you know, to sealed. There are some people who speak of sealing. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 says, who had also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. So the question is, are we lost the moment we sin? No, the blood of Jesus covers our sins that are not intentional. But if we sin intentionally, purposefully, rebel towards God, then the sins are not covered because it's habitual, it's purposeful, and it's intended. But as long as we remain in this body, we can even repent of those sins and be back in full fellowship with the Father. Ain't God great? This is the concentric circle that I'm talking about. You know, because it is possible while you were saved to commit sin and to repent of those sins and be brought back in full fellowship with the Father. We would not be lost for grace does give us some wiggle room to move away from God for a time, but it never allows us to remain unrepentant in sin. Hallelujah. Another version of this uh, uh, veering away of the, of the false doctrine is sometimes described as Christians are sealed from sin. The thought goes something like this. You're born again, so sins you commit cannot penetrate your spirit, which is perfected, and then the verses on being sealed by the Holy Spirit are used to give the idea that we have been vacuum packed by the Holy Spirit to prevent sin from entering our spiritual man. You know, it sounds humorous, but some people believe strongly in this and think, oh, God has sealed and perfected our spirit so we cannot sin against him. Oh, hallelujah. May God help us not to fall into this trap and the false doctrine of sealing. Hallelujah. Now, as we wrap up, I want to talk about the body and the soul. Amen. You know, God is a, a triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when he made man, he made us tripartite beings. A man is spirit. We possess a soul and we live in a body. Spirit, soul, and body. So therefore, Sin is an act of will that is committed by the soul and spirit and sometimes the body. See, the soul and spirit of man are inseparable. There is no way to separate your soul from your spirit. The only way that we can discern the difference between the two is through God and his word. And Hebrews 4, chapter 12, uh, you know, tells us this. So Paul writing to the Christians uh, at Corinth teaches us in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sins or adultery sins, sinneth against his own body. Now, Paul teaches in this passage that, you know, uh, sleeping with a prostitute or is sin with the body. But notice every sin that a man doeth is without the body. Without here means not using or not with the body. If every sin besides sexual sins of fornication and adultery are not with the body, then what are they with? They are done with the man's spirit and soul. So all sin at its core is spiritual in that a man's spirit participates in it. All sin is solical in that a man chooses to do it with his own volition, you know? So although it is true, we can say that, you know, we can uh, uh, sin and say saved, this whole concept of being sealed from sin is not what the Bible teaches. You know, we are not sealed from it forever. We don't have an impermeable membrane that separates us from sin. We guard our salvation with trembling, with fear and trembling, guarded jealously with the help of our helper, the paraclete, 